All right, welcome everyone to this event run by the Indigenous Studies Discussion Group or ISDG at the University of Cambridge. We are grateful to the Center for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities or CRASH, as well as the Cambridge Heritage Research Center for helping support this group and making this event possible. The ISDG is a graduate student-led initiative that started in 2019 with the objectives of one, promoting scholarship by and about Indigenous peoples across disciplines and spaces to be a regular feature of the intellectual life of Cambridge, and two, promoting and sharing and the discussion of insights and ideas pertaining to Indigenous studies across peoples, disciplines, times, and geographies. Oh. My name is Leanne Daly, and I'm a second year PhD student at the Department of Archaeology here at the University of Cambridge, where I study the Beothic. And that's obviously very relevant to today's uh, event as we are screening the documentary, The Beothic Story. So the Beothic are the indigenous people of Newfoundland, an island off the east coast of Canada, and they are believed to have gone extinct in 1829. So that is the story that colonial literature tells us. But as you'll see in the documentary, there are other versions of this story. As the title suggests, the film brings together previously unrecorded stories and voices to help challenge what's in the history books and in order to tell the Beothic story. After the screening, which will run just over an hour, there will be a Q&A with the director of the film, Christopher Aylward, along with Chief Mizel Joe, and Carmen Bartlett may join us a bit later on. To give a bit more detail on our speakers, Christopher Aylward makes films about the cross-cultural interaction of human beings living in very different orbits. He's worked in several African countries, including Rwanda, Zambia, Malawi, and the former Zaire, as well as with Indigenous communities in Canada. He holds a PhD in history, archaeology, and narrative theory, and has served for years as program director and associate professor of film studies at Ryerson University in Toronto, specializing in writing of film, documentary research, and film production. Misal Joe is chief of Miyapakek First Nation in Newfoundland. Since 1973, he has been involved in First Nations politics, first as a counselor and later as traditional Sahama and Newfoundland district chief of the Mi'kmaq Grand Council. Chief Joe is also the spiritual leader of his people. In this capacity, he has gained recognition provincially, nationally, and internationally, particularly in the area of spiritual healing. In May 2004, he was awarded an honorary Doctor of Laws by Memorial University in Newfoundland and Labrador. In 2012, he was actually awarded the Queen's Jubilee Medal, and this recognizes individuals' contributions to making Canada a better place for our communities and collectively by helping to create a smarter and more caring nation. And in 2018, he was awarded the Order of Canada, which recognizes outstanding achievement, dedication to the community, and service to the nation. We are honored to host him and our other speakers here for the Q&A later this evening. So before we begin this, the screening, I'm just going to have a few, um, sorry, we're just gonna enable the transcription here. Um, we're going to just have a few housekeeping announcements that you may be familiar with, mostly for our Zoom audience. So shortly we will post a link to the film in the Zoom chat along with a password in order to access it. Um, and then after you've watched the film, please then return to this Zoom meeting uh, where we'll be hosting the live Q&A. So when in the Zoom meeting, please keep your microphone turned off. During the Q&A, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function for that. Um, if you would like to ask the question in person, just indicate that in the chat um, and then we can actually unmute your microphone and then you can ask your question yourself. Or if not, like I said, you can just put it in the chat and we can read it out for you. The Q&A portion of the event will be recorded, so please keep that in mind and keep your cameras on or off as you prefer. By remaining in the room as we record the meeting, you consent to be recorded. The recording will be available on the CRASH website and on the ISDG Cambridge YouTube channel soon after the event. Captioning has been enabled and, uh, and will be enabled again for the Q&A. So if you'd like to have captioning, you can select that at the bottom of your screen. Please note that the captions are provided by Zoom and that CRASH cannot be held responsible for their accuracy. But again, rest assured that you can revisit the video on YouTube afterwards. So we are doing our best to provide an inclusive environment in this hybrid event. And it goes without saying that all attendees are expected to show respect and courtesy to speakers um, and others throughout the event. So without further ado, we will now send the link to the film in the chat along with the password in order to access it. Um, and just so you know that uh, the password does have a capital at the beginning, so please remember that once you're um, inputting it on the web page. Um, we will then reconvene in this Zoom meeting one hour and 15 minutes from now. So please enjoy the film.
the video. And just, just to say, if there's any questions or concerns throughout, please unmute or, or put in the chat. Um, we will keep the Zoom going, but until then, please uh, open the link and watch the film and then we'll reconvene in the Zoom meeting. Thank you. With the Optic Story event. Um, we will now be joined by the director of the film, Christopher Elward, um, and Chief Nizal Joe, uh, who you'll now know a bit from having seen them in the documentary. Uh, I know some people will be um, sort of logging back on as they uh, just finish up the end of the film here. Um, but just to sort of start off, um, Chris, I hope you're well, doing well, um, and I'll sort of uh, throw to you for your reflections on the film, but I know that uh, quite a few people uh, here and also joining us virtually are actually graduate students, so I was hoping to sort of just kick off the Q&A, uh, basically talking about, you know, how this project came about um, and how your graduate research sort of, you know, turned into this documentary. Um, and then if we could uh, move on to Chief Joe and sort of see how he was able to become involved in the project and sort of the significance of, of the Optic story and that documentary. But if we can just start off with you, Chris, and, and your reflections. Sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes. uh, all good. All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in and, and watching the film. It's, it, it's a real joy to see it getting out finally into the world and to have so much interest, particularly from such a far off place. So, so much appreciated. Thank you for your time. I hope you got something from it and really looking forward to your questions. Um, gosh, how did the film begin? So, so it's a, like most films, a, a very long time in the making. Um, I, I did work with the Mi'kmaq of Khan River um, probably uh, just over 25 years ago. And it was through my work with that community that I became interested in indigenous okay. questions in Newfoundland. Yeah, you're going to be up there, but you, there's so many people on, they're not going to see you. If you turn on your video. Yeah. Hey, Mizelle, how you doing? You're in, buddy. I can see you. I don't know if you can hear me. Oh, you should, you should be able to hear us, um, Chief, if you, you are muted right now, but we'll be able to make you a They're call. They'll see you. Okay. Awesome. So, so did you want me to uh, keep going, Leah? Chris, if you can continue uh, just telling us a bit about the project and how it came about, um, and then Chief sure. Joe will uh, uh, come to you afterward to tell us a bit about how you became involved in the project. So take it away, Chris. Okay. So uh, I, I was talking about the fact that about 25 years ago, I, I became involved with a... Uh, a, a documentary project with the Mi'kmaq of Khan River. And this is how I got to know um, Mizel and all of the other uh, wonderful people in Khan River. And it, it's really where um, my interest in a lot of these issues was sparked. Um, I, I suspected and, and was, it was very quickly confirmed that there were, uh, 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 there was a lot of interconnectedness between the Mi'kmaq and the Biotic people. So it was something I was very interested in exploring and exploring other um, connections as well that have largely been overlooked or completely uh, omitted from the historical record. So uh, in a midlife crisis, I went back to school and did a PhD in archeology span history and uh, something called narrative theory or narratology because I, I wanted to look at the written history of the Beothic people as story, as narrative, as a narrative structure. Um, this is nothing new within the um, philosophy of history and uh, within narratology. This has been an, a, a discussion for some time now, you know, the, the narrative structure of history, the more obvious components of which are narrative bias, narrative cultural bias, right. um, and the degree to which, you know, certain aspects of a narrative are, are shaped according to our narrative expectations. Um, it was very interesting in the case of the Biafic, because the, the, the expectation is extinction. This is a story which, you know, since the death of Shana Dithid in 1829, which is almost 200 years ago now, we have been fed in Newfoundland and um, in other parts of the world that the Biafic people with her death became uh, extinct. So I, I wanted to look at the narrative structure and, and I, I did. So I spent 
um, a couple of years uh, reading extensively in narrative, uh, uh, narratology, uh, the philosophy of history to kind of get my head around um, the, the whole issue of history as narrative and, and to which extent it could be challenged. Um, and then I spent a lot of time uh, looking at uh, various indigenous ways of acquiring knowledge and, and realized that there was a huge gap between the two. Um, so part of my research for my doctorate involved, uh, I, I was curious to get the other story coming from everyone else. So I, uh, with the help of Mizel, and it was an enormous help, um, was introduced to a number of people within the Mi'kmaq community throughout Newfoundland. And then from there, the Innu community, and one group would refer me to another. And I, I think when I'm talking hey, uh, to- Vanessa. Can you hear us there, Mizel? okay? Uh, it's background. Oh, you're getting a background noise. Oh, I guess, uh, it goes there. It Chris is talking, but there's also background. Oh, wow, I wonder what that is. Sorry, Chris, you can continue. No worries at all. Um, and, and so from there, I, I so I'm speaking with Joseph Mark to a translator at one point um, in Labrador, and he suggested, you know, I really think you need to talk to people in this area of Newfoundland, the Great Northern Peninsula, which I hadn't considered before, because he said, you know, this was the natural channel for people to emigrate from Newfoundland to Labrador up through this peninsula. So. Um, it, it was largely through that process that I got to know people and I was referred from one group or from one individual to another. And um, so I, I spent a, a couple of years doing that oral history research, which involves um, touching base with people, talking to people and, you know, first and foremost, answering the question of why I was interested in this as a, you know, white guy from St. John. Um, and it often took some time to get to know people and sort of to get to, to explain where my interest was coming from, where my curiosity was coming from and, and why this was such a burning issue for me. Um, and, and from there, things tended to go very well with the interviews. The, the, the interview process was exhaustive. I, I've done films in a lot of different places and, and, and my friend Mario Antonietti, who shot the film for me, and who had also been to uh, Con River in Newfoundland, shooting with me there and in different locations in Africa said, you know, this is by far the hardest thing we've ever done, the most emotionally draining thing we've ever done. And, and it was, even though we had worked in, in, in very challenging situations beforehand, um, because I, I, I was um, humbled and, and very moved by the extent to which people kind of cross that enormous cultural chasm that existed between me and them and, and confided uh, a historic version um, that for which there was absolutely no audience or for whom they felt there was no audience. And that was one thing native people warned me along the way, you know, fantastic sense of humor, but why are you doing this? Like no one's gonna be interested in it. Anyways, so I, I did these interviews over the course of a couple of years. And since I am a filmmaker, I thought it would be ridiculous to do this without shooting the interviews. And we had a racket with that, which Mizel may or may want to uh, speak to because the university wanted nothing of it. No, no, we would, and we're trying to withhold ethics approval, despite the fact that the people who, uh, who I had approached um, wanted to be shot on film. Um, there was like a, a very paternalistic universe, uh, our attitude from the university about, you know, them deciding what could and couldn't be done in the course of the, the research. But we, we got beyond that. I, I, I shot the, Ms. L wrote me a bang up letter and then a lot of other people sort of just spoke to the university and said, look, this is ridiculous. If people want to be recorded on film, who, who, who are you if we're following all protocols to, to stop this? So it was allowed and um, we shot the interviews and uh, then, uh, gosh, where can I go from there? A, a lot of um, elders from various communities were interviewed and many of them have since passed away. Artie and her grandmother are two, but there are many others as well. So um, I, once the film was done, which was not until 2022, life kind of intervened and slowed me down for a while. And um, 
so, so and, and then there was the question of raising the funds to, to try to be able to finish the film properly so that it could ultimately be distributed to a, a, a worldwide audience, hopefully. Um, so we finished the film and then was the challenge of getting it out into the world. I'm sorry, that's a very long answer. I hope that's not too much, but that's sort of, so, so it came about, um, but one thing I should say, which is when I went from my reading in narratology and the philosophy of history to interviewing uh, indigenous people throughout Newfoundland and Labrador, I was absolutely struck, probably not that surprised, but it really made a huge impression on me that the people I was interviewing were saying the exact same thing about history and the telling of history that um, these philosophers and various theorists had been saying from a European perspective. So it was really interesting to see that. And that was reiterated over and over again. I also got the same story in terms of the Beothic and how they had been interpreted and what perhaps their true history was from all groups. Um, and it didn't matter if I was speaking to an 18 year old in Shishishi or a 91 year old in, you know, on the great Northern Peninsula, people all gave me the same story. Um, were very, very similar versions of the same story. Um, so yeah, that, that was, I mean, I could go on forever, but I guess we need to leave time, so. Yeah, no, thank you. That was a really great answer and, and gave us some sort of perspective on, on how everything that we just saw sort of came about. Um, and now I'd like to ask Chief Joe if you can tell us um, how you became involved with uh, Chris's research uh, and sort of what is the significance of this project and, and the Beothic story to you. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the quick question. I'm, I'm, I'm muted some way. We can hear you perfectly fine. I was just saying that um, we're hoping to hear a little bit more about how you became involved in Chris's research and the significance of the project to you. Well, it was incredible to hear uh, the same stories across Newfoundland and Labrador that we've been hearing all of our lives as well. And when I first met Chris, he told me about this, uh, I guess, adventure that he was going on. I was so intrigued by it. I want to, I really want to be part of it because he was going to uncover uh, the truth that, uh, that we've been told. It was all a lie. Of course, the other part of that is that uh, we we grew up in a time when we uh, was told and, and taught in school that we were brought to Newfoundland to to kill the Beothic people. That was our sole purpose of being here, which is uh, just a European myth that's been going on for the last ever since John Cabot arrived in 1497, and uh, it's still it's still being taught. It's still being talked about, and uh, I thought you know that, that Chris's video would uh, misspell some of those myths uh, that's been out there forever. And you know, I, I don't believe for a minute that it will ever stop, but all we can keep doing is to keep talking and telling our story. And uh, that's what we've been doing, we'll continue to do. And I want to thank Chris very much for, for what he's done to, to bring this out into the open and have people talk about it. I was so amazed that when I told my story and my next door neighbor told her story, and then when you go to Labrador and other parts of Newfoundland, they're telling the same story that I'm telling, and even in Nova Scotia. Uh, so it's, it's incredible uh, that the stories that we, were, we grew up with and lives on and will live on all in our lives and all into the generations to come, because the truth is out and is well known at this stage. Great, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And um, as we have said before, um, to our audience, you can feel free to add your questions to the chat or ask to be unmuted, but we actually did have a couple of questions uh, already, so I'll just ask them now. Uh, these are from Ian Chambers. Uh, how do the Beothic respond to the fact that a Google search today on the Beothic brings up a link to Wikipedia, which claims that they are an extinct group? And do the Beothic see any similarities, lessons, or warnings to Native peoples in the USA? I'm thinking of the Pequa, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and their recognition by the US government in 2002, or the Kootenai Nation of Idaho's war against the US in 1974 that resulted in granting land for reservation and increased funding. So if Chris or Chief Joe, if you wanna answer one of those questions. 
Uh, I can dive in for the, for the first part. Um, so how do the, the Beothic respond uh, when, when they're told this? Um, well, I guess like all people, we respond differently. You know, some people despair, other people um, laugh at it. Um, there was a tremendous amount of humor in uh, the telling of this film. I don't know if it, can, it comes across. Um, uh, it, it also frustration, sometimes real extreme anger that a Wikipedia search um, presents this. We're hoping that will change. Newfoundland is very much on the cusp of addressing its history um, and understanding the concept of colonialism and post-colonialism and the fact that this is not limited as your question suggests to Newfoundland, but it's really a global phenomenon. I mean, this whole idea of the last of an indigenous people is, is not unique to Newfoundland. Um, you know, it, it's been very difficult for people of Beothic ancestry to have their voices heard. I, um, I was uh, interviewed on a local radio station and uh, about um, the film and some of my work. And, uh, you know, I said, look, why don't you throw your line open to indigenous people? And it would be interesting for the, to hear from people themselves as to what their experience was. Um, and uh, uh, I, I didn't, you know, actively seek out people. I just kind of left it on the, uh, in, in the interview. And um, someone did call in a, a Beothic descendant and was absolutely humiliated on the radio. And this was only in April of this year and called me up later and said, I'm a fool, I'm a fool, I'm a bloody fool. And I said, no, you're not, you know, it's an important perspective you have, but the world just isn't ready to hear it yet. Um, so that's been a real challenge. And so I would say with frustration, I mean, the, the issue with the, the descendants of Beothic people is that they're in all different pockets, as you may have seen in the film. You know, there are people in Labrador, there are people on the Great Northern Peninsula, there are people within the Mi'kmaq communities, there are people within little pockets of Newfoundland. And um, there's no real collective entity which represents them. And I think if that changed, we could probably see the history change as well. I don't know, Mizell, if you have anything to add to that. How do people respond to being told that they're extinct? Yep, by, by all means. Um, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but yep. uh, yeah. you know, um, we were we were <laughs> written out of terms of union in 1949, so we were we were yeah. told that there's no such things as um, Indians in Newfoundland. So there is no Indian problem. So the terms of the union uh, basically had more uh, discussions around keeping the butter or the margarine yellow than, than changing it. That was the terms of the union. But at the same time, we were deliberately written out of the terms of the union. We're extinct. We were not, we didn't, we didn't live here. So I, I understand that part of what, what you would feel when somebody says, well, you're extinct, you're all gone. And, and we've been saying for forever, that no, they're still here, they're still among us. And one of the silliest things I, I in your film, Chris, was that uh, um, no, they never had sex or whatever you call it. <laughs> that that made me laugh. I think that was one of the best laughs I've had in a long time. How in the name of God could you could you even think that or even say it? Uh, knowing our history, uh, that's the only way you can populate. And whether or not we stole women or, uh, and, and had sex with them. Uh, we know it did. Uh, and whether, whether they stole our women and had sex with them, we know that happened too as well. When you go back far enough in time, that was the way of life back then. And uh, of course, the other part of that was that uh, Mi'kmaq people were brought by the French to kill the Beatic people. That's a myth. If there was only one Mi'kmaq person or two, or, or as they were called back in Canadian Indians were brought over to, to work with the, with the French. That, that applies to all of us? No, it don't. Uh, people have been using these, our people have been using this, this long, just as long as the Beatty people. And, uh, and our, our own history uh, tells us that that's so. So yeah, I, I understand that feeling of being lost and uh, lonely. Uh, especially being separated from the rest of uh, mainland Canada. And the fact that we could never have come here to this island and brought us here, which is another one of the uh, lies and myths that's been told. 
uh, we've proved that you can actually cross the Gulf in a birch bark canoe, and we did that. Uh, we built our 24-foot birch bark canoe and uh, went across the Gulf to Newfoundland, to Nova Scotia, and all the way up to Bedore Lake to meet the Grand Chief. And there's some really funny stories around that, but even when you look at the crossing between uh, northern uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, you eight miles or nine miles, that's that's a short walk across on the high seas during the winter months. So we know that some of our people came across uh, from from Labrador and come down uh, north to and ended up in Con River and become part of our people. So the fact that the other people went back and forth on a regular basis, it was not a, not a, not a what I question that happened. And, uh, and I swear to my maker, I know they're still here. Maybe not that someone said that the culture of the Bali people uh, is not alive, but I'm telling you that the Bali people is alive among us. And there was an marriage between our people, Mi'kmaq people, and the Bali people. Thank you. And we do have um, a question in the chat from Tanya that I'll just read out. There was one point in the film where there was a distinction made between the survival of the Othic lineage with DNA evidence and the, quote, death of the Beothic culture. The implication seems to be that the survival of the lineage is not enough to claim that Beothic survived today. What are the people's reflections on this line of argument? And this is sort of what um, you were just getting at, Chief Joe's, this idea of, of sort of the difference between genetic survival and cultural survival. Yeah, I, I can jump in for a bit on that one. Um, I know the exact point. This is a great question, Tanya, but a little bit uh, disturbing to me um, because uh, I, 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 I don't, I hope that that isn't the suggestion of the film. Um, many academics uh, were, were making the argument, even those who, who were very open to the idea, not very open, but you know, didn't have much choice but to be open to the idea of the Othic uh, lineage existing. Um, uh, still claiming, oh, well, the Biothic are extinct because their culture is extinct. Um, you know, non-native people in North America have a very long history of uh, searching for the authentic Indian. Um, and, you know, you would no more expect in 2022 an Indigenous person in Newfoundland and Labrador, Biothic or otherwise, to, you know, smear herself with red ochre and travel by canoe than you would expect a German person to, you know, eat sauerkraut and wear lederhosen. I mean, um, so so our our view of what a Beothic person is or might be has not evolved at all in 200 years. And to expect any Indigenous person to, you know, emerge from a life of isolation in the interior, um, it, the way the earlier Beothic, primarily women, did, it, it is absurd. Um, so I guess what I was doing in the film, when I, I know the point you're referring to, Tanya, when David says, um, I think the culture is dead, but I think, you know, the descendants, of course, there are descendants of the Beoth people still here. Then we cut to an interview from another man who describes, I mean, he's alive and he is describing having been raised in a culture that very much acknowledged that they were of the woods. And then he goes on to explain how there were a group of women in the small outport community of Newfoundland where he lived, who spoke the Beothic language, uh, which many other people didn't understand. And they spoke the language between them for um, until the last one died in 1935. And that was over a century after the Beothic had supposedly disappeared from the face of the earth. And so if you have someone telling you that his grandmother told him these stories, that his grandmother taught him a song in the Beothic language, and here it is, um, if you have a living, breathing, many living, breathing people in front of you showing you that, you know, we make boots in a, in a very, very distinctive way that's not practiced anywhere else in Newfoundland, and, you know, these beautiful boots made from seal skin that are submerged in a marsh, and then, uh, you know, they, they, they put the long bindings and, and that, that the women use to tie up the boots and it, it, small details, even the way people um, 
structured their lumber. You, you know, they, they're, if they cut down a, a, a bunch of uh, loggers for construction, they would put them almost in a, a wigwam shape, you know, and there are glimpses of this in the film. Um, you know, that there is a habit in Newfoundland in which many, many people in rural communities will have two houses, um, one on the coast and then one more on the interior and they will migrate back and forth between these houses with the seasons. I mean, Newfoundland culture has been influenced by native and uh, or indigenous and in that I would include Mi'kmaq, you know, and definitely Beothic in ways that we have never openly acknowledged. So my own personal feeling is that the death of Beothic culture is a complete fallacy that of course a culture exists. The very culture in which we all live collectively in Newfoundland has been shaped by Beothic in a way that is never acknowledged. Um, I mean, to the extent that there's an academic who, who built much of his career discussing what he called the concept of winter housing, which he saw as being unique to European immigrants in the new world. And, you know, that people would migrate back and forth between one, um, one dwelling and another, depending on, you know, they'd have to be by the coast for certain resources in the summertime, and then they'd have to be in the interior to be able to cut wood and get away from the worst of the weather and for hunting and trapping. Uh, and, and, you know, he said, this is remarkable that because there was absolutely no uh, interaction between Europeans and indigenous people. And this is the only place in the quote, new world where this happened. I mean, what a absurd assumption, you know? So again, sorry, I'm rambling here. Ms. L, you might want to jump in, but uh, I, I would disagree with that conclusion. And, and, and I think it's unfortunate that, that the film possibly suggest that because that was never my intent. Our, our people uh, in the 1800s lived in wigwams on the beach uh, during the summer months and, and during the winter months they went back to the interior simply mm -hmm. because uh, during the summer months it, this was like a grocery store. Uh, you could every kind of fish and, and everything that you wanted was right here. And during the winter months, they, they needed to be away from the beach. So they, they moved inland and they built their winter houses or winter wigwams. And it was closer to the food that they needed, caribou, uh, mm -hmm. that they were trapping, beaver and other, other animals that was on the land. And, and they could live very comfortable. And today, right this day, we all have winter houses. I've got one. And mine is a bit cold for me. I'm getting old. I can't take the cold anymore. But, but uh, we all have two houses. Or majority of the people in this community have two houses. One that you live in uh, because it's uh, you have the electricity and the telephones and modern day stuff. But uh, you will find many families got clusters of families built around their mom or dad's uh, winter houses, and they they still use them. So that culture lives on. Uh, you know, when, when uh, we lived in, on the beach in the 1800s, there was only one person at that stage enough to translate the sins for the bishop that came in to hear confessions. And, and that's, of course, uh, in the 1920s, the language, the culture, the traditions of this, this community was outlawed by one parish priest. That the language didn't die, our culture didn't die, our traditions didn't die, we continue to do that. But because of the fear of the church and of government, uh, it sort of went, I guess, in, in a way, went underground. And people still spoke with, within, uh, the, the, when they're on the land with their children or the families, they still spoke the language. My mom, my dad spoke the language. Uh, I, I don't remember enough of it to have a conversation now, but if I was in Nova Scotia for a couple of months, I'm sure a lot of it would come back. But uh, yeah, winter houses are still around, and we have two houses, uh, you know, and uh, I'm building my third winter house pretty soon. I think our moderator has quickly disappeared. Um, 
I wonder if I should jump in here. There, there's another question from Murray to everyone. Ms. L, you might find this one interesting. Are there any efforts underway in Newfoundland and Labrador to find more mitochondrial DNA matches to Damasdewit and other Beothic? Um, did you want to talk a little bit about that and Steve's work in Con River that he's doing? Yeah, we, we are doing that now. And uh, but I think Steve Carr has done a lot of work for us. And right now, there we found two people in Con River uh, that have that, that, I guess, X marker. And we're now waiting for a little while before after this uh, COVID period, of, but we'll get back and doing some more work. But there are other places in Newfoundland that are doing the same thing as well on their own. And, uh, you know, you just can't go to any site. That has to be a, you know, a site that's a respectable site. And so Steve Carr did that for us, uh, finding the right site to do it. And uh, we have about 50 or so people that's been tested here as well. And like I say, it's got to be done uh, on, on the, the female side, not the men side. So we do have we do have two people here that have that marker. Okay, and, and so just to explain, Steve Carr is a geneticist at Memorial yeah. University who, who's very interested in uh, indigenous issues and has been working with the Mi'kmaq for several years now. And I think he's got a new article coming out to that extent or to that effect, doesn't he? Miso? He said I, I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and I definitely have more more work that we uh, we have uh, commissioned them to do as well with us. Right. Okay. Um, there's another question here. Uh, I don't see Leanne, so maybe I'll just read it. Perhaps adding to Marie's question, are there more digs ongoing in Newfoundland? The movie raises a very interesting point that the state seemed resistant to finding things which might upset the established narrative. Um, uh, and that is, I'm glad that point came across loud and clear in the film because um, there is tremendous resistance to finding out anything that might contradict um, the narrative that we know. Um, I mean, there has been, that's a bit of a blanket statement. There have been people within academia who've been very open-minded and, you know, a couple of them have been huge influences on my own work. Uh, Priscilla Renaud, for example, in Newfoundland, who did a lot of work on port area. Uh, and Priscilla has since sadly passed away. And there's uh, Charles Martin uh, from Quebec, who was also very interested in, uh, and both Priscilla and Charles explored prehistoric, meaning before um, European written history, uh, relationships of indigenous peoples throughout Atlantic Canada. And both of them really challenged the idea that the Beothic existed in a cultural and genetic vacuum. Uh, and they made a very strong argument that um, th th there was uh, intermingling between the Beothic and all peoples in Newfoundland. Um, uh, there was another uh, archeologist slash historian, Ralph Pastori, who did quite a bit of work in Beothic excavation. Sadly, um, all of these people have have since passed away. Um, Jim Tuck, who's featured in the film in Fairyland. I mean, what's interesting is that even in areas where there have been excavations and they primarily looking for European settlement, for example, in Fairyland, where they're looking at, quote, the first colony, um, you know, it, as they were digging and uncovering all of these hearths and stoves and ceramic pieces from various parts of Europe, underneath this entire layer, they located um, arrowheads and stone points. And well, how do you explain that? And, and they're under the European layer, meaning they were there first. Yet the historical narrative has always been Europeans were there. And then the indigenous people came because they were drawn to the area by you know, European nails and things that they could scavenge from European settlement, which, which is a, a, a very problematic um, assumption when you find the indigenous material under everything else. Again, long answer to that question. Um, I mean, Mizell, you could talk about archaeology within the whole context of the land claim, the Mi'kmaq land claim, and, and what a debacle that turned into. Yeah, we, we've uh, done extensive research all across Newfoundland, and 
and one of the sites was in a little passage. And in that site, we found uh, Briotic and, and Mi'kmaq artifacts. We also found crockery uh, that was made in Florida and it came all the way from Newfoundland. So there was an extensive uh, trade route that came all the way from Newfoundland from Florida, mind you. And we've also found a site on the land that had uh, Biotic and Mi'kmaq on the same site, almost at the same the same time. And uh, that site has not been disturbed very much, but I'm afraid, you know, over time people will find it and start taking things away from it. But uh, that was one of the sites, the interesting sites that we found. There were others that we found too as well. Uh, you got to keep in mind, after uh, 200 years ago, people, uh, the other people sort of uh, moved to the north for their long day flights and, and it, without being a treaty of any kind, our people sort of stayed away from the north and moved further south. And from time to time, uh, there would be uh, uh, sightings of each other according to our story and it basically left people alone and uh, we knew that they were being slaughtered they were being shot on site we know that from our own research uh, that was happening on you know every chance they got i had actually had a man tell me that from his story that he, his great grandfather shot a pregnant biotic woman that was stealing uh, food from his garden this is in central newfoundland so those are the stories that we grew up with and continue to have and continue to talk about because this is a, a part of our, our history that we want to share with the world. Um, you know, in 1822, uh, my my relative, Sylvester Joe, walked across Newfoundland with uh, William Cormack, who was the first white man to ever cross the interior of Newfoundland. And his sole purpose for crossing uh, Newfoundland was to... Uh, see if there's any pockets of the other people that were still out there. And he didn't find any of us simply Sylvester choose not to show them where they were. Yeah, he would fear that they would point them out and, and the same thing would happen. I actually wrote a historical fiction about that journey. And I've got another one on the way that's going to be more fiction, but it's about based on some of the stories that we grew up with. So it's, uh, we, we need to be talking about this uh, every chance we get. To anyone that'll listen. Um, I can't see Leanne. Oh, I'm here. Um, I'm oh, you're there. Gonna, I was just going to follow up to uh, give voice to some of the questions that were coming through on the chat. Um, right. So we have one from Oliver. I wanted to ask if there have been any attempts by those identifying as Biotic before or since the documentary um, to bring together um, and institutionalize the descendants and gain official recognition. And then uh, he follows up and we'll come back to Felix's question, but he follows up saying, if not, do you think that may happen in the future? Is it something the Biotic would like and what may be the steps to achieving that? Uh, I can jump in on that one, maybe to start. Uh... Yes, there have been attempts by those identifying as Biotic. Um, it, it, it very, very recently, I would say. I, I mean, to, to understand uh, the issue, I think you need to understand it, and hopefully that's clear in the film, that the tremendous price that people in Newfoundland and Labrador paid for acknowledging their um, Indigenous ancestry, be that Biotic, Mi'kmaq, uh, Inu or otherwise. Um, so often it was something within communities that, that, that was, was hidden for very good reasons because there were enormous uh, financial, for one, economic consequences to identifying as native, i.e. you just couldn't get a job. Um, but beyond that, th there was also the perception and the very real perception among the Biotic that they were endangered and, and that, um, that there was an almost uh, systematic attempt by certain, a, a small group led by the Peyton family within the settler community um, in the late 1700s and, uh, and early 1800s to wipe them out as a people so that they would no longer be in conflict with the Peyton's commercial fishing interests in on the Exploits River. They, they um, uh, exported obscene amounts of salmon from that area, from that very river, as the Biotic starved around them for 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 decades. Um, so, so there was a fear of persecution, and Mizel will probably want to speak 
to this within a, a Mi'kmaq context because many of the Biotic who, who ended up among the Mi'kmaq people um, wanted their identity hidden. So, so, so this has been entrenched for a long time. And so many people have, it's very common in Newfoundland to hear someone who, who, who looks um, indigenous uh, describe themselves as having Portuguese or Spanish ancestry and, and because there, there were fishing fleets from those countries here for centuries. Um, it was a far more socially acceptable lineage to own. Um, so things are changing very, very rapidly. Perception is changing, I think, in Newfoundland as in other parts of the world. But I, I think you probably heard within the film that there were several people who, even within their own family, there were people who said, you know, do not identify me as Indigenous. I am not. And they, they would have absolutely nothing to do with the issues. So, so um, there are very good reasons for that. And, and, and in one interview, you know, I, I explained that to the interviewer. I said, look, you know, people are reluctant to come forward because when they do, and often with a genetic claim, for example, I've had a DNA test and this is what it said, um, they are absolutely ridiculed by the mainstream press here, you know, by the CBC and by the, uh, the CBC is incredibly, astonishingly closed minded locally in this respect. Um, but it's not just them, it, 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 and it's coming institutionally as well. The university is very resistant to it. So, it, it, you know, it, people have come forward and say, yes, I have Biotic ancestry, and they're always vilified. I mean, Ms. Ellick, there's another thing you might want to touch on is look what happened when you made that suggestion about the renaming of Red Indian Lake. You know, the whole province went absolutely berserk because it was an indigenous name. Um, so, so, so Indigenous peoples in, in, in Newfoundland and Labrador have a very good reason to be very careful about how they identify. That said, um, I am aware of several attempts of people very locally, some of them coming from the film, to, to, to kind of collectivize. But uh, one fellow I know from an outport community told me there was, a, you know, because I ask this question all the time, why don't people collectivize? Why don't they I, I identify publicly and try to organize? Because there's more strength in that rather than the voices of disparate individuals. Um, it's fear largely, particularly among the older generation. And I remember him telling me, he said, you know, he was in a room surrounded by elders and said to them, we are Beothic. And every single person in the room nodded their head. Um, but there was no interest in pursuing it beyond that room, obviously for a very well-founded fear that they would be ridiculed, laughed out of the room, not paid any attention to. Um, so I think that is changing. The other thing is it, it's intergenerational. I encountered this Michelle, with a lot of things in Con River too. I mean, often the elders have knowledge that they're carrying forward, but um, you know, people don't live forever. It, it does need to be passed on to the next generation. And we live in a very different world than the, the carriers of this knowledge grew up in. Kids have so many different distractions. And, um, uh, you know, often it's, it's a question of interest. Like, does a child who has this lineage, does he want to take it on? It's a huge burden to bear. And, and many people, I would guess, just want to get on with their lives, you know, because the backlash against Indigenous um, voice in Newfoundland can be so strong. Mizel, do you want to add to that in any way? I think the, the Red Indian Lake story is a great one. Oh, I think we may have lost. Looking for, looking for Chief. I'm going to change the gallery here. Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. So Chief Joe, if you could just tell us um, perhaps a bit more about the recent uh, Red Indian Lake event. That's what Chris was referring to. Some people may not be as familiar with that news story um, here in the UK and abroad. So if you could just give a bit of uh, background on that. Um, and again, to, to follow up on just seeing if the if there's been a sort of shift in, in the discourse and how people are talking about this either before the film or since the film. Um, and again, maybe how that played into the, the Red Indian Lake renaming event, if at all. Yeah, there, there is an incredible shift uh, with this new government in Newfoundland. And the first time lives, we are now meeting, uh, talking to the Premier once a week, the, the five Aboriginal groups in Newfoundland are now talking to the Premier uh, every week. Uh, and that was something that was started by the previous governor, but never got off the ground. But this premier has done that. And there is a shift. 
And you've asked me about uh, Red Indian Lake and things that I, I would like to see changed, and I, I, I did. Now, mind you, there was a little bit of confusion around uh, the name that I gave, but I thought at the time we were looking at a burial site or a monument site for the remains that were brought back from Scotland in uh, uh, 2017 or something like that. And Which I gave you them, spearheaded yourself. Yes, uh, because nobody else would do it. So I, I did. And so I gave him a name of Wantagodi, which is a peaceful place. And that got confused with the renaming of, of Indian Lake to what it's called today, which is a biotic lake, which is incredible change. Now, mind you, there will still be people that'll uh, never change their minds in regards to the name change, but that's fine too, but it's been done. And there are other things that's been done. I don't, I'll hold up a poster I don't know if you can see it or not. This is the latest uh, change that now the government of Newfoundland is doing is this is a poster that was designed by a young girl in Con River that will now be become a part of the Confederation building. Can you hold it down a bit, Ms. L? We can't. It, it... I think it's because of the background. It's picking it up as, as like a solid. Oh. You can you see it? We can see the very top of it, but when you hold it up higher, we can't see anything. How about that? No, not at all. Maybe okay. right up in front well, of your face. How about that? <laughs> no, it disappears. Yes, you're right. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, now that statue is a, a man, woman, and a child. And that reflects back on to the man that was shot on the, on the ice up on Biotic Lake. And uh, the woman would be uh, the woman that died from tuberculosis. And our people say that uh, it was not natural causes. She was taken into a place that was, uh, at the time, tuberculosis rapid in St. John's. So in a sense, she was murdered. And all the stuff that we've been hearing about how she called out the Peyton name, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that she was probably telling Peyton or to spit in his face for all that he'd done to her. She was actually a captive and, and used as a slave. And uh, one thing that Cormac did was take her out of there. And, uh, but also at the same time, took her into the place that was rampant with tuberculosis. You got to keep in mind taking people out of the woods and take them into a city like St. John's back then. Uh, they had no immune system for those kinds of diseases. And uh, so basically she was killed uh, because she was a biotic person and they wanted to find more information. Uh, and that's where we are today. Thank you. Um, and I'm just gonna follow up on Felix's question from the chat here. Um, he said, as an anthropologist, I wonder how many Canadian anthropologists understand their role in creating the false narrative that has defined the Biopic. I see many parallels for indigenous or tribal in India and other places. So again, this is something that's very central um, to the documentary as a whole, and obviously even, even just the title being the Biopic story. So again, if you could just speak a little bit about, again, the significance of the anthropologists and sort of where that um, narrative was kind of originating. Right. In Newfoundland, um, academically, there, there, there's been a split at Memorial University between the departments of archaeology and anthropology. So um, it is primarily archaeology, uh, which has addressed um, the question of the Beothic. Um, I mean, obviously, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, of cross-referencing back and forth there. Do they understand their role in creating the false narrative? Um, I would say almost not at all would be my response to that. Um, again, there are exceptions to this. As I, I mentioned, Charles Martin in Quebec, Priscilla Renouf here in Newfoundland, Ralph Pastore in Newfoundland, but sadly, all of these people have passed away. Um, I mean, there is a general acknowledgement now that the, which is very, very recent, I would say within the past year, that the story is perhaps more complicated than we have admitted. But um, rather than people understanding their role in creating the false narrative, I would suggest that they defend their role in creating what they still believe to be the true narrative. Um, 
And it's really interesting. Um, after the film aired in December on NTV locally in the province, there was a letter from uh, a woman who has written um, what many consider to be the definitive book on the Beothic that was published in the late um, 1990s, uh, who wrote and said, you know, this long and damning with faint praise uh, assessment of this, the, the, the long and interesting film misled its informers to, to the uh, conclusion that the Beothic people may still be alive. The Beothic are extinct and she hammered away on this point in a letter that was published only six weeks ago in uh, the Telegram. Uh, and, and this is probably, I mean, to our absolute aggravation, the prominent voice on the Beothic people, um, which defends vociferously the idea of Beothic extinction and cannot stand for that to be challenged. Um, I have, in my work, encountered tremendous resistance to the idea of a false narrative from many, I would not say all, but many academics and particularly the ones to whom people seem to listen for some reason. I don't know, Mizel, did you wanna answer any of that about academics and their... Well, the one in particular for sure, that, that the only one that I've had any, any kind of uh, connection to at all. Um, you know, um, when, you, when we look at our own history, it, it's kind of similar to what happened to the other people. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, in the beginning, that same kind of thought was that uh, we're immigrants to Newfoundland. We couldn't have found our own way to, uh, to Newfoundland. We had to be brought by somebody else. And this goes back to history, which says uh, uh, the English met a ship off the coast of Newfoundland in the 1700s. And they're all uh, Mi'kmaq sailors. So this to them was the first time that we were coming to Newfoundland. And, and they also drew an accurate map mm. of, of, of the surrounding Newfoundland for the, for the sailors. So anyone with any common sense at all would know that if you come to the area for the first time, how in God's name could you draw an accurate map for those people? And that map on Birch Park still exists today. And uh, that's, you know, where we come from. But you got to keep in mind, too, as well, where our people was running from a Cornwallis and each proclamation in, in 1749, uh, who um, proclamation said that you had to kill uh, every living Mi'kmaq person in Atlantic Canada. And that includes men, women, and children. For that, he offered uh, five pounds sterling. The second year was 10 pounds sterling. The third year was 20 pounds sterling. And our safe place in Newfoundland was St. Pierre Miquelon. And so our people gravitated toward Miquelon. And uh, actually in, in, the, in the early um, century of, of uh, 1800s, there was, a, there was a British ship in the mouth of, of Betisburg where we live. Uh, that uh, turned away 200 big mall people from coming into this area. And that ship uh, got stuck in the ice and stayed there all winter. And uh, so a lot of our people left, some people drowned, and some of them made it back to uh, Miquelon and other parts of Newfoundland. Placentia became a part of a, a safe haven for us in Newfoundland as well, as well as inland. And uh, people uh, still say today that there is no sign of you along the coast. Of course not. Why would there be? If you're running from uh, a people that was trying to kill you, then you found places in the woods that nobody else could find. Uh, in, it was 200 years ago before the first white man ever ventured out into uh, the wilderness of Newfoundland. So if our people was out there, they didn't go by themselves. They took their families with them and they lived there. And so the, so the narrative that's been uh, painted uh, by the Europeans. It was one that uh, only they could write. Uh, we didn't write our history. Our history was all the horror history. And if you're an academic, uh, of course, you don't want to hear a horror history. You want to hear someone that could regurgitate uh, somebody else's story and make it their own. So it continues that one lie leads into another lie and another lie and continues as part of history. If I could follow up on that, Leanne, because Mizel just made a, a really good point. 
about oral history. Um, so within a PhD process at Memorial University, one of the things you have to do is to, as with most universities, present your research before you go out into the field. And I did so before the Faculty of Archaeology. And I spoke extensively to a room full of academics about the fact that I was interested in exploring native oral history, indigenous oral history throughout Atlantic Canada, mostly Newfoundland, Labrador, and Nova Scotia. And there was a collective yawn in the room um, as I presented slides of various people and talked about these individuals, gave their names, and talked about the fact that they had a family history of the Othic ancestry that they could trace back. And it wasn't until I mentioned the case of one of these people having had a DNA test, which was not done deliberately to determine Beothic ancestry. It was done for a completely different uh, reason. And that DNA test of Artes is discussed in the film. And all of a sudden, this room of 30 or 40 archaeologists snapped to attention. And everyone was all over me with questions about, you know, the, the test and did it really prove and oh, this is remarkable. This is a game changer. And I said, you know, why is it that this woman and her family have been um, saying this for generations and no one will listen, but the minute there's a Western empirical test that you all understand and reference, all of a sudden we sit up and pay attention. I mean, that, that very much proves the point that people cannot acknowledge knowledge from another cultural perspective, um, that it has to be their own. Um, so that really shocked me, the, the idea that, um, you, you know, that, that this valuable knowledge was, was of absolutely no interest until it was backed by an empirical scientific test. That's one point I, I wanted to follow up on, Ms. Ellen. Another one, this person whose name we're not mentioning, this uh, woman who wrote the book, Ingeborg Marshall, she, um, uh, when the whole question of the renaming of Red Indian Lake came up. Mizell proposed a, a, a name in the Mi'kmaq language that meant peaceful lake, which was a, a very wonderful gesture to try to give the, the lake a name that was fitting to, to the only ancestral remains that we're aware of that he had repatriated to Newfoundland. And there was such a vicious backlash to that. And that backlash was fed largely by this individual who wrote extensively to the press, who was interviewed on the radio and went back again to the Mi'kmaq mercenary myth that the Mi'kmaq people were brought to Newfoundland by the French to exterminate the Beothic. This is the person who has written the definitive book on the Beothic and hammered away again and again at this point. And it was very, very saddening to see these issues resurrected. That was last spring, it was in 2021. So I'm sorry, I just had to dive in with those two points that yes, there are active, I wouldn't say so much from academia, this person is older, was never an academic and um, but, but, but has influenced academia enormously and continues to do so to, the, to, to this day. So, yeah. Thank you. And I think that um, both what you and Chief Joe were saying about um, this narrative that's been sort of perpetuated, but fortunately that there's this idea of this shift and that um, the oral history that's been told for, for so long is finally sort of getting out there to the wider mainstream public um, that they're able to hear these, these different versions. And again, that's what's so beautiful about the documentary is actually getting to hear people talk about their own history, their family history, and actually bring these different stories to the fore. Um, and we are coming up on time here, but I'll just ask if there's any last minute questions from the room or from our virtual audience. And if not, we well, can... Well, we're waiting for that. I'd just like to dive in and say one last point, Nan, because I, I don't want to give the wrong impression. And I think Mizel would agree with me on this, that on an individual level, most people in Newfoundland and Labrador that I've encountered are wide open to the idea of 
history being different from what we were taught. On an individual level, there are a tremendous number of people who are extremely interested in it. Just the reaction to the film has been wonderful. It has been by and large completely supportive with some obvious exceptions, which we've already discussed. Um, the institutions in Newfoundland, however, are another story altogether. Academia is threatened by the rewriting of this narrative. Um, because many people have based their academic careers on it. Um, government is very threatened by the revision of this narrative, which for reasons explained in the film challenges uh, and, and presents the potential of land claims. Um, uh, media is very resistant to this narrative because they have proclaimed an alternative media for so long. Nobody likes to be proven long, wrong. And, um, Newfoundland is a place where the settler population, it, it, it's unusual in that it has a very strong local culture that is extremely distinct within Canada and within the world, and it prides itself on that. And, and I think the idea of the Beothic narrative as being different from what we have accepted um, challenges our collective sense of identity, and people are threatened by that, and they resist it but mostly um, that resistance comes from uh, institutions. I also wanted to say thank you, Tanya, for, for the, the kind comment that you didn't feel the film implied um, that the author culture was dead. It was great to see, thank you. Great, thank Is you. And yeah, I think that um, we didn't have any more questions in the chat, but if either of our speakers have any final comments that they'd like to make before we go into closing remarks here. Giselle, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, mean, I do actually. I was thinking about, you know, uh, what <clears throat> the Europeans and the government continue to say to us. Uh, you have no rights in Newfoundland. You don't have a treaty. If you want a treaty, you got to go back to Nova Scotia. And they keep calling us immigrants. And that's, this is coming from people, mm -hmm. uh, immigrants themselves that come to this island, uh, you know, uh, five, six hundred years ago. And so... Uh, because uh, of this one incident of uh, off the coast of Newfoundland in the 1700s. So we become immigrants to, to Newfoundland and be called immigrants by immigrants themselves. So it, it's, a, it's a funny way of looking at the history and the real history of Newfoundland. Uh, they need to take some history lessons, if not from us, then from someone. Uh, we don't have the fancy titles after our name. So um, we, we, we like if you like Chris would it be Chris is a, a well-known person and you have the they have the right titles after his name so Chris if they don't listen to you they won't listen to anyone I don't know about that but thank you <laughs> well it's been fun doing this by the way it has it's been great thank you very much yes I hope you answered everyone's questions all right yeah I think we got to everyone that had questions in the chat as well um, and so I'd just like to thank uh, Chris and Chief Joe again. It's really an honor to be able to host you both here virtually, of course, um, and to be able to show that film and, and to have a bit of Newfoundland here in Cambridge. It really is an honor um, to, to be able to host this event. Um, so again, we'd also like to thank our audience both virtually and here at Crash in Cambridge. And please do keep an eye out on our website and YouTube channel um, for once we post the, the recording of the Q&A. Our next event in our regular term to term program is a panel entitled Decolonizing Rights to Natural Heritage and the Environment, which will take place on April 27th at 5 p.m. on Zoom. So for more details for our program and events, you can also visit us um, on our CRASH webpage um, and the links that will be in the chat. And if you'd like to get in touch with us at all, you can feel free to um, email one of the emails that will also be sent in the chat. But again, I'd just like to thank uh, Chris and Chief Joe so much for being with us here. Thanks and have a great evening. Could, could I just dive into thing? Uh, there's one thing I forgot to mention. Felix, who's in the audience, um, was an enormous influence in helping get this film done. I showed him footage of this five or six years ago, and he lit a fire under me that uh, assured that it would actually get finished. So I just wanted to acknowledge your your participation and it, thank it's you. It's a wonderful, it. wonderful film, Chris. It's so important for people to thank see you, everywhere. Felix. And You've been a wonderful to you, Joseph. I, I, to Chief Joe, I, I really, really hearing your voices, how you bring the voices out. It's magnificent. It really is magnificent. It's a work of true anthropology, 
engaged anthropology, whatever you call it. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I actually touched the remains that came back from Scotland. Uh, and uh, when, I, when I touched them, I had a sense of en enormous amounts of pain and suffering. And I actually cried. And um, it's there. And the, the pain and suffering that he had gone through is still there when he knows remains, as I said in the interview uh, some time ago, that those remains are not home yet, and they will go home, and that not disappear until that happens, whenever that's going to be. That's not up to me, but somebody will find the time. Thank you, and we do hope to all be able to follow this story um, and hear more from, from all of you and, and be able to see how, how things continue on and how the Beothic story, the documentary, is just sort of, sort of that start and will keep going on and on. So thank you again so much for sharing, um, sharing all of your thoughts with us here today. Well, Alio. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good thank evening, you. everyone.